Hello, hi, my name's Edward, and in this video we're going to talk about uh, contrasting terms. So these are some teaching concepts that are really useful. Uh, these terms are kind of opposites, uh, and they're really useful to think about when you're planning your lessons. Okay, so we're going to talk about declarative versus procedural knowledge, explicit versus implicit learning, deductive versus inductive teaching, controlled versus free practice, and accuracy versus fluency. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, let's start with procedural knowledge. Now, procedural knowledge is knowing how to do something. It's our automatic performance, uh, and it's often called motor skills, okay? So, this is kind of related to our body, things that we automatically do with our body without really thinking about it, okay? So in terms of language teaching, uh, this is uh, how we think and react uh, automatically when we're speaking, okay? There are some examples down here. Um, driving a car and riding a bike are both examples of procedural knowledge. Now, when you're driving a car, um, a lot of the things that you do with your body kind of become automatic, right? You're changing gears, you're pressing the brake, pressing the accelerator, you're moving your feet, you're moving your hands, you're indicating. Um, when you're riding a bike, again, lots of things are automatic. You're balancing, you're pedaling, you're turning the handlebars uh, just a little bit. So a lot of these things with our body become automatic when we're doing these things. Okay, another example is painting and drawing. Now, when you're painting, and drawing, uh, if you're an expert, um, you know, choosing the right colors and the, the brush strokes that you're using and things like that uh, kind of become automatic body performance, okay? You, you might not be really thinking about exactly every little thing that you're doing. It, it becomes automatic. Now, for uh, language, um, an example here is um, many native English speakers and grammar rules. Now, the rules of grammar for native English speakers and also Koreans and other second language speakers who learn uh, language and, you know, becomes automatic. These grammar rules become automatic. So when we're speaking or when we're writing, for example, we're not thinking, uh, we're not thinking about the, the grammar rules, okay? Kind of these expressions and the way that, the way that we put sentences together when we're, we're speaking becomes automatic and we, we don't think about exactly which word follows which word, okay? So these are examples of procedural knowledge. This is when the procedure of doing something uh, becomes automatic. Now the opposite of this is declarative knowledge. And this is knowledge that we can declare. This is knowledge about something. It's conscious and verbalized. It's often factual information, things that we can explain, things that we can say, okay? Some examples, uh, metalinguistics is declarative knowledge. This is language we use to talk about language. That is metalinguistics. Uh, so an example of that is explaining a grammar rule. Uh, if you can explain a grammar rule, uh, that means that you have declarative knowledge related to that grammar rule. The final example is explaining how a bird or plane flies, okay? So we can explain how these things fly, but we can't do these things ourselves, right? We don't have the procedural ability to do these things, okay? Okay, so um, actually going back to grammar rule, if you think about it, young learners and children, they can speak language, but that doesn't mean that they can explain what they're speaking and what they're saying and the grammar related to what they're saying, okay? Um, so declarative knowledge is um, um, perhaps in language more common in adults. So here's an example of the two basic kinds of knowledge. Uh, you can see declarative knowledge is related to facts, information, and ideas. So for this, it means that students will understand something. For procedural knowledge, it's related to strategies, skills, and processes, okay? So for procedural knowledge, students will be able to do something. 
And here's an example. So have a look at the first picture. The bird is flying and the man is uh, trying to fly, I guess. Um, so the bird has procedural knowledge, but the bird probably can't really explain or it doesn't know the physics and the reasons how it can fly. But the man might be able to explain how the bird flies, but that doesn't mean he has the procedural knowledge. Okay, the second example here is a picture of a, uh, a child skipping. Now, this child, I'm sure, can skip with a jump rope better than I can. Okay, but that doesn't mean the child understands the physics of what they're doing. Okay, the child, uh, you know, Maybe they can't explain about gravity and movement and things like that. But the child has better procedural knowledge than I do. Okay. Okay, let's move on to explicit versus implicit learning. So let's start with explicit learning. Explicit learning means there are clearly defined goals and awareness of what is being learned. Uh, explicit learning is easily observable and common in adults. So some examples, memorizing word lists, using dictionaries, and learning how to learn, thinking about the learning process and planning the learning process. These are examples of explicit learning. Implicit learning is different. This is not directly expressed. It's incidental, not conscious. It's not easily observable, and it's especially common in young learners, okay? Also, you know, adults can also implicitly learn, but for young learners, they probably only implicitly learn. They, they're never planning their learning. They're never trying to, uh, you know, they, they don't go to school thinking, I'm going to learn, right? They just learn by ha having experiences. So some examples here. Uh, life experiences and field trips and things like that are examples of uh, implicit learning. Um, so when you go on a field trip, for example, to a zoo or a museum, you're probably going to learn lots of things while you're there, right? But for young learners especially, they wouldn't be trying to learn. It would be um, incidental. Uh, the next example, projects and discussions, okay? So when we're doing projects, when we're doing discussions, we're, we're learning things, we're practicing language, um, but perhaps we're not clearly thinking that that's what we're doing. And the final example is learning from classroom language. Now, when the teacher uses English to teach English, um, the learners will be exposed to lots of expressions, lots of vocabulary and things like that. Um, so the learners can learn from classroom language. Come in, sit down, open your book. Uh, those are all expressions that learners might learn, but they, those expressions might not be the focus of the lesson. So they're um, incidentally, implicitly learning English by listening to classroom language. So here's a, a visual to help you with this. Explicit learning is what we can see on the surface when we observe learners and when we're in the classroom. But underneath the surface, there is a lot of implicit learning going on. The students are making connections, the students are listening to language, the students are um, thinking about things and, and, and uh, you know, learning lots of new things that we can't easily observe as teachers. Okay. Let's move on to deductive versus inductive teaching. So deductive teaching is student-centered and it starts with an explanation of what we're going to learn and then moves to practice of those things. The goals and objectives are clearly stated and very clear for the learners. And the learners then apply the rules that are learned or the expressions that are learned and practice those expressions. So for example, the teacher explains regular past tense verbs ending with ed. And then the students complete a gap fill activity to practice this grammar point. Okay, so notice how the teacher explains the grammar point at the beginning, it's very explicit. Uh, and this is deductive teaching style. Now, inductive teaching, 
this is more student centered and in this way of teaching students observe examples of the language first maybe they listen to a dialogue uh, maybe they hear a story um, they uh, hear examples of the language in context and then later the students generalize the rule okay so the rule is not clear at the beginning the rule comes later in the lesson and usually that you know the students can kind of guess the rule or work out the rule by themselves later on because they've heard lots of examples. Now this style of teaching involves noticing and have a look at the uh, text on this slide. Can you notice some text that's in a different color? Yep, the pink word noticing. So this is a noticing technique. If you use a different color, or some kind of bold or underline or something like that to make uh, a part of something more noticeable, then this is a noticing technique. And it's really useful for when you're teaching language um, because you might want to draw your students' attention to a specific word or a specific part of a word. Uh, so using a different color or underlining or bold or something helps students to notice. Um, you might, for example, um, highlight the S on a uh, plural noun to help students to notice the S on the end of the plural noun. Okay, an example here. Students read a text about someone's life experiences that contains many instances of present perfect tense. They then write about their own life experiences later in the lesson. Now, notice the beginning of the lesson, the teacher doesn't explain about the grammar rule and it, it isn't explicitly stated what the grammar rule is going to be. Instead, the students look at lots of examples of the grammar rule, okay? And then hopefully by looking at the examples and, and doing some practice activities with the examples that they can write uh, a similar thing um, a similar text um, using the correct grammar, okay? So you can see that inductive and deductive teaching moves almost oppositely, okay? So uh, with deductive teaching, it starts with general rules and then moves to specific cases and examples. Inductive teaching works in the opposite way, okay? So inductive teaching starts with examples and then later uh, focuses on the rules. So think about which sequence suits your lesson content and target language, okay? I'm not going to say there's really a right or wrong way of doing this, but different types of learners, uh, different um, situations and contexts will call for a uh, different uh, type of organization of your lesson. Okay, let's move on to controlled versus free practice. So controlled practice, this means that specific language structures are used. Uh, it's very predictable and also it's teacher centered. So some examples of controlled practice, uh, drilling, which is repeating after the teacher. This is very controlled um, and very teacher centered. Uh, gap fill activities, okay, completing gaps on a worksheet is very controlled. And questions with limited answers are controlled practice. So let's have a look at free practice. Now in free practice, uh, this might include many language structures, many different types of expressions. It's unpredictable and it's more student-centered. So some examples, debates and discussions are more free activities with many outcomes and open-ended questions. So these allow for more free practice, okay? If you give learners more options, more open uh, opportunity to practice language, then this is more free. Okay, so here's a visual to help you understand. So you have the controlled car on one side. You can see that uh, this car is controlled by a uh, uh, a, a remote controller and the free practice is Wally the robot okay so he has his own opinions his uh, his own ideas he can do what he wants he can move around 
Um, so he is not controlled, he's free. Okay, let's talk about accuracy and fluency. Now, accuracy is language use without grammar mistakes. It means correct spelling or pronunciation. And it also means language that is appropriate for the context. Uh, some examples here. Uh, drilling, again, which is repeating after the teacher. Drilling focuses on accuracy. Uh, written language exams. Um, these probably focus more on accuracy than fluency, okay? When we're assessing with written language exams, we can notice the accuracy of your writing more clearly. And the final example is learners who don't want to make mistakes. Now, some, some learners are like this, you know, they, they're worried about making a little mistake when they're speaking in another language and they don't want to make mistakes. So those learners are more focused on accuracy than fluency. So let's have a look at fluency. Now, fluency is the natural flow of language. And this flow of language means that the pauses sound natural. This is a big part of fluency. Uh, when, you're, when you're a fluent speaker, it means that the pauses in your speaking sound natural. They're a uh, good, uh, you know, natural kind of place in the expressions and in the sentences, and you pause at the right kind of times, okay? Um, the final part about fluency is responsiveness. So being able to respond to somebody or something uh, at a suitable speed is part of fluency, okay? If, if you ask a question to somebody and they can't respond quickly, then they aren't very fluent. So some examples of this, um, active communicators, uh, tend to be more fluent. Uh, meaning is more important. So people who want to express meaning, um, but maybe sacrifice accuracy, they are focused more on fluency, okay? And learners who are willing to make mistakes, learners who want to try to express themselves, to express what they mean, uh, they are more focused on fluency. Okay, so let's, uh, well, here's a, a diagram for you. So you can see that accuracy and fluency should be balanced. Sometimes you might want to focus more on accuracy. Sometimes you might want to focus more on fluency, but they're both important and you should consider both. So try to help your students to have a balance. And here's an example. So here's a waiter standing outside a restaurant, maybe in France or something like that. And he sees some tourists walking by. And he says, hey, food, drink, table, come to these uh, potential customers walking by. OK, now, is this fluency or accuracy? Is it an example of fluency or accuracy? OK, now, is it accurate grammar? Are those correct sentences? No. Those aren't correct sentences. OK, but we understand what he means. And, you know, he can he can say that easily and the, the people can understand what he means. So he's he's sacrificing accuracy for fluency here. OK, so I hope that um, this has been an informative video to uh, discuss these contrasts and understanding these contrasts is really useful for teachers uh, when you're planning lessons and when you're thinking about the kinds of activities that you're going to include in your lessons. Okay, so uh, take care. Bye-bye.